Well, my name is Roberto Henriksen de Villa Cis, and I'm, I'm an artist. And what does that mean? That means that I tried to create something out of nothing, basically. And so it's all about the mind and the spirit and the soul. And our work really is to try to create immortality in a certain sense and try to create um, just out of thin air. You know, the most famous, of course, is Pablo Picasso, a piece of paper and a crayon and the famous dove that he created, you know, that for us is the sign of world peace. So as all artists, we always, you know, we're all trying to create something that is outside of ourselves, that's going to be able to speak to all of humanity. So, and that's in a big term, in a humble way, you know, I just try to do my thing by what I can, you know, as an artist. And so I started United Aliens as an artist and as a fashion designer to try to group um, creative people together and to make a kind of symbiosis between the different arts so meaning theater dance fashion fine arts because they all speak the same language at the same at the end of the day and again like I said it's making something out of nothing you know out of thin air and try to make it something that's really incredible so we started in the 90s um, between London Paris and uh, and Milan, and that's because I was a fashion designer, and so all the people that I was meeting during that time, um, all we were all kind of in the same journey in the sense of you know trying to find something more spiritual or something beyond ourselves of what we were doing. So we ended up meeting like-minded people, like like my dear friend Jody Kidd that I met. You know, on I was an assistant at at Vogue uh, as an editor, and I met her when she was just very young, at 15 actually. And, you know, funny enough, she's the one who kind of got me back into the whole alien thing because I had seen a UFO when I was very young. And, you know, we're not allowed to talk about seeing UFOs or aliens or anything like that. And she was, you know, 15 and spoke about it very freely and openly. And I was like, well, have you ever seen a UFO? And she was like, no. I'm like, well, I have. And she's like, oh, my God. So I was like, oh, wow, actually, people are not so scared about talking about the UFO situation. And, um, I mean, I don't know whether they're real or not, but I saw... You you know, more than once, unidentified flying objects. And so, you know, a few years ago when I started, I said, let's do an art collective, a fashion collective. I was like, what am I going to call it? And I was like, well, I'll call it United Aliens. Because in the sense of, you know, the whole story of like, you know, here we are on this planet Earth, and are we, you know, we're all alienated from one another, but if we get together, we're stronger. And so that's how it started. And then we started just off by calling us United Aliens, and then, we turned into United Aliens Artists. And then over time, we became, which, you know, the high point of United Aliens Artists was, you know, we were having art shows all over the world. And all of our campaigns were all media campaigns because I realized that art had to leave the gallery space, had to leave the museum space, and it had to go into the public forum if you really want to make an impact. So we worked with magazines like Days to Confused um, in, in England, actually, was where we you know, first started it. And Donna Trope, who was one of the great photographers, of the, and so she did the campaign, Jody did the campaign, Jake and Dinos Chapman, who were a great bit, Britpop artist, Farushka. So, you know, it was all these different people. We all came together, and then we would do happenings, and we would do events, and we used fashion as a platform. And so that's how, it, how we started, and then it evolved to the point where we were, we were the first fashion, uh, let's say, people or, who were accepted to be part of the Art Basel uh, Art Limited installation, which was a very famous show that happened in the year 2000. And they selected only 40 artists out of the 1,000 artists that could have been selected to represent what art was happening today. And we were one of the first 40 artists, actually. So we really are officially part of the art world and part of the fashion world. And so I'm trying to bring those worlds together because usually the art world doesn't like the fashion world, the fashion world doesn't like the art world. And this was early on. Now things have evolved, you know, and now you have a lot of symbiosis between art and fashion. And where we've now grown as matured, we turned into a foundation. And in the mid-2004, in, in mid around there, we really, you know, even a little bit earlier, we started going, uh, our energy was focused into helping the charities, into helping the well-being of other people. And first was the ecology and the environment and, you know, to try to eradicate poverty. So, sorry. So in about 2008, I started really like thinking about, you know, what I wanted to do and, you know, what was my purpose? 
in itself. And I said, you know, we have the charities. And again, because we all come, or at least a part of our United Indians, we're so focused on, um, on the arts. And then, you know, when you're an artist, you have to think, how am I going to get the word out there? So I was, the slogan came up of glamour saves the world because in a way it's ironic. It's the, the epitome, the opposite. You know, people think of glamorous people and they don't think of people that they're helping the world or anything. But there actually are quite a lot of people from the glamorous world, the world from uh, the elite, let's say, the top 1%. Not all the top 1% are horrible. You know, there is a very, 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 you know, generous group within that. And, and they've always been helping. And so they started helping. So when I went, reached out, because before it was just our family money, our family foundation, but then we reached out to have other families help us. So, you know, one of the families was the Berger family from Switzerland. And they, you know, they, they've been helping us with the children, with the environment, you know, with small projects. So the projects that, you know, that, so it was more than a slogan, sorry. So one of our Glamour Saves the Rules projects is, to help save the elephants funny, and the Amazons, which funny enough is how do you think you link the Amazon and the African elephants? It's because the elephants are being hunted down for their ivory. Now in the Amazon, we have an alternative to the ivory, which is the vegetable ivory, which you know they call, there's different names for it, but basically it's, it's a nut and it has the, you know, a fruit nut and it has, it's exactly the same as ivory. There's no need to kill an elephant. You can, you know, you get it from a plant-based. And so we discovered that, you know, in the Amazon, they really, they don't have enough resources to get their materials out there or designs and so what we did was started you know designing certain things working with the community of the women out there so they do like hunt and forage let's say you know which is a very sustainable way of keeping the forest instead of you know cutting down the tree so this is one of our projects is you know it's a very simple thing but it's again it's making jewelry so that's in the amazon side of the ecuador ecuador also touches the brazilian amazon so in order to help the brazilian neighbors we realized that they so much trash on the beaches with you know aluminum cans and everything like that and we saw that the arts and crafts people in brazil were knitting the bottle caps of the, so the soda pops into these bags and you know they weren't very pretty my mother came back she's like oh can you please make something out of these things and i thought to myself oh my god they're horrible they're so ugly the design's so ugly you know and the colors are so ugly and you know my mother said but aren't you a designer that's your job you're supposed to make it nice and i'm like oh okay you're right and so you know i designed some very simple designs and you know now that community has grown to the point where you know the designs of my bags are you know they've been the selling at museums and to our collectors whatever but they've but tell me. so i i decided to go to do very simple geometric shapes which is the circle the square the you know, these very very simple shapes and to only work with aluminum color i mean just to add no other color to the to the aluminum because in brazil what they were doing they didn't they wanted to hide the fact that they were soda pops you know they wanted to they were ashamed that they were soda pops so they would paint them so i explained to them i was like no we don't want to add more toxic waste or chemicals or anything just keep them simple and silver and um and so they look kind of like space age space age bags and now it's become a huge trend we've been doing it for 10 years and then everybody else saw you know the other community saw and then the tourists started buying and so now it's like a, it's like a major trend these silver you know bags but we were the first ones to to do them about 10 years ago so um even though the, sometimes we create products that we help to sell you know, in the sense we or we commission them, and you know it takes like so six months. People, so back to glamour saving yes. the world. So you're commissioning indigenous people, you're giving them employment. Yes. So what glamour saves the world does is we try to be uh, on the ground, you know, and basically it's in the most extreme, severe places. So like the Amazon in, in Ecuador or the Amazon and the beaches of North Brazil, they have no employment. It's very difficult, and especially for women. And handcrafts is one of the best ways to ensure the culture continues and it's, you know, environmentally friendly. And these people, these women especially, are able to sustain their families. And, um, and that gives them a sense of well-being and of worth, no? Because otherwise, 
the, um, these even these indigenous uh, communities, in order to find work, they have to abandon their forests, they have to abandon their homelands to be able to go into the city to be able to make money. And then, you know, they go into the cities and what, they become housekeepers or, you know, lowly workers, you know, and so then the, the poverty is just continuing. They were better off in the forest, you know, because there at least, you know, they're with their families and like this. So. But the part of our projects is, are very small, you know, they're, they're what we can do. Is, so, and that's why I say we're at fashion, glamour saves the world. In the sense of what I mean by glamour is, in a sense like, oh, like glamour models or something like this. Glamour, fashion world, you know. Because fashion sometimes is, I realize, is the closest thing that some people will come to art or culture. And, and it's the closest. They'll never go to an art gallery. They're never going to go to, you know, they're never going to go to the theater. But fashion is something that's relatable to everybody. And so fashion as a way of communication to get larger, broader issues, I think, is a great platform. So, you know, the very famous artists, of the most world's famous artists, Van Gogh, as you would say, or Picasso, have always been considered geniuses, but somehow they've always been considered on the border or on the fringes of society, almost like crazy people. And, and in a way, maybe they are, because they're seeing things that are different from other people, and so they're slightly ostracized. And in fashion, we, that happens to us as creative people as well. The, the elite designers of the elite world of the fashion world, let's say the ivory tower, you might consider the most famous one who, who died is Alexander McQueen. You know, he became a victim in a way um, of his situation, of his success, of becoming a multinational corporation because he's, he's an artist. He was a very strong artist. He knew his vision. He, he had it all together. But I think what ended up happening with him was is that he got crushed by this big system because he, all of a sudden he was a billion dollar designer. And he just, I don't know what happened to, to like I said, I don't want to go too much with, with his story. But I think the pressures of, you know, of him, of his situation, of his sexuality, of, you know, the pressures of the businesses and the pressures that the business people put on you as an artist. And because what happens in a lot in the fashion world is that they, 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 they love to have, you know, they want all the craziness, they want the avant-gardeness, and they, they want you to be extremely out there. And then once you reach a certain fame or name or something, then they want to uh, liquid, liquidate or they want to just, you know, filter down your concept into this, a simple handbag or something. And then if you're not able to make a hit handbag, then they just throw you out because they're like, oh yeah, you're a great big designer, but you haven't been able to make a hit back. And I've actually heard this quite a few times. So the fashion industry, that's probably one of the most well-known who got hit in England. But I think the, somebody who, you know, also had a very big impact on English fashion and style is Isabella Blow. So Isabella, not well known, but she was a longtime journalist and stylist for the Tatler, and she was one of the one of the great ladies, aristocratic ladies of England, who helped discover so much talent from the art world and from the fashion world. I mean, the most famous is Alexander McQueen, you know, probably, and the most famous one living today is Philip Tracy with the hats, and she really adopted them as children, and she suffered quite a lot from. I mean, it's not because of the fashion, but she suffered quite a lot from the Cinderella complex of, you know. You know, always feeling or something getting something you know not not what she should have in a way and the fashion world she felt also had treated her very badly because she had done so much for the industry and then so much and she just felt you know in a way that they didn't respond and actually she was leaving the fashion world you know when at the very end in the sense that she wasn't really so interested in the fashion world anymore at the at the end of her life you know actually after her second attempt to at suicide or maybe it was even her third and um, and actually, I mean, I hate to say, it, but she actually became a much nicer person, you know, having gone through all these traumas and survived the suicides. At the end of her life, um, she was very empathetic, and she really had turned a new leaf. And she was just like really sweet when, because I had first met her in the 1990s in her big heyday, and she was a little bit arrogant. You know, she was a little bit like this, you know? And so, you know, lovely, but at, I don't know, somehow or other she changed as well. She had turned a new leaf. 
And so Izzy, we had become great friends, and it took me 10 years to make her first dress because it was kind of intimidating because, you know, she was McQueen's child, baby, you know, um, muse and everything. And so it took me 10 years to make her first dress. And it was when she was in the sanatorium, when she was getting well, I kind of channeled her and I said, oh, let me make her dress and so that she'll wear it when she gets up because I didn't want to think that she was going to die in a mental hospital. So I make this beautiful, adorning black dress for her. And then when she does finally get out, and, you know, we have the fitting and she's like, oh, you know, you've made exactly what I wanted, you know? And so I was like, oh, great. You know, and she couldn't believe it that I was thinking of her when she was at the mental health. She's like, you really? And I was like, yes, of course, Izzy. And so I think what happens a lot of, to these people who are very depressed like that, they feel like people aren't really thinking of them. They don't feel like they're, you know, part. And so I mean, that's part of this big campaign that we want to do is just reach out and say hello, talk to them, talk to anybody, you know, and especially if you feel like somebody's depressed or they're vulnerable because of their situation. And, and Izzy being an artist herself, really, at the end of the day, you know, she was very vulnerable. She was very, very, you know, as strong as she was and as everything, she was just like a, like a delicate flower. And so people have to realize that in our industry, you know, is that you like to have all these glamorous people around and creative people around, but we do have to be treated nicely, you know, because... We're cared for, you know, we, we're not meat, you know, we're not, you know, a commodity, you know, that's, that's not what we are. And so what ended up happening was that when I started to do this tour of the Glamour Saves the World tour, I thought of Izzy, you know, she has passed away, you know, quite a few years ago now, it's 2007, almost 10 years, but her spirit's always with me because she always gave me great ideas and she gave the greatest ideas to McQueen and to everybody else too. So I'm like, hey, listen, I'm gonna listen to the Queen. Um, so I was like, okay, Izzy, so what should I do? And she's like, well, make me my dress that I wanted. And so that was her last dress that she had commissioned, was that she wanted to have an incredible dress. She said, make me something even more outrageous and more expensive than McQueen's. And at the time, McQueen's dresses were a quarter of a million pounds his dresses, his couture dresses. So jokingly, I said, okay, I'll make you a million pound dress. And Izzy said, no, two million. And I was like, Izzy, two million? She goes, no, make it three million. And then at that point, you know, we sit there in her Eaton mansion, da da da, I was like, okay. I was like, I'll make it for you. When are we gonna do the fittings? And she said, we'll meet at the Maharajas in India. And I said, fabulous. I said, I'm invited to this, we were invited to the same party basically. So. Uh, a few months later, I get down there with my sketches and my little fabrics and this things is, like this. So where are you? Oh. Um, oh, I'm starting to explain the beginning of the Glamour Saves the World I Tour. Know, but you oh. think physically, you say the Maharaja in Oh, in India. India. Oh. Just tell us a little bit about where you are now. Oh. So, so you're with it. it Izzy in, in this palace, yeah? Yeah. No, so what happened was Izzy commissions the dress and we're supposed yeah. to have our fittings at, in India at the Maharaja's palace. So we both invited to the same wedding, um, the, the Burman wedding. And um, what ended up happening was I showed up and we thought Izzy was there. Oh no, Izzy's not here. And we didn't think much about it. We just said, oh, she stayed home. You know, asked the Maharaja, where is Izzy? Oh, I don't know where Izzy is. And then, you know, months later, it ends up that she had been depressed and she committed suicide. And so, you know, it was all, you know, very tragic and very sad. And so when I decided to start this whole Glamour Saves the World tour, for me, she's one of the most glamorous women in the world. She, she was one of the most glamorous. And so I decided I'm gonna dedicate this dress to her because in her honor, in a way to give her credit for people to know who she is, because a lot of people don't know who she is. And, and I think that, you know, would make her on the other side, would make her happy to know that she's remembered and, you know, she's thought of. And so I said, I'll make her her million pound dress. So, um, and everybody thought I was crazy, but I was like, no, I'm gonna listen to what she said. And so I started making, you know, my sketches and my plans and my tour and, um, and the Brazilian benefactor, who was one of the philanthropists of, uh, of Brazil from the ballet, we meet. And I also do a project with the, with the ballet and he was a sponsor of the ballet and I explained to him my project of the million pound dress in honor of Izzy. And he says, I love it, that's great, it's all for charity, and it comes with, you know, it comes with a ballet, it comes with the, with the musicians, you know, it's a whole theater that goes around this world. Um, because that's what fashion is, in a way, it's like a theater, it's like a giant circus, in a way. So it's like the circus coming to town. And, um, and Mr. Perotti was his name, very lovely man, and he says yes, you know, so I had to do like, you know, the business plan reverse. He says yes, and I had to make a business plan. But in any case, he says yes, and you know, three weeks later, this was, this was only just a few weeks ago, this was right before coming to London you know, for the London Fashion Week, and he commits suicide. 
And just going to stop with the word commit. Can we stop oh, yourself? Yeah, kill himself. Yes. So as I was preparing for my Glamour Saves the World tour, coming to London, and I have my patron, you know, the Brazilian billionaire, Mr. Perotti, who's commissioned the, the first dress, you know, to represent the continent of South America. So it was supposed to be the link of the Amazons. And with the ballet and the theater and all these artists, everything was, was fantastic. And I had a guest list of 20 people for my first tea party because what we do is, you know, couture is very kind of private in a way, you know, in a way you do want to say who all your clients are, what they do. So it was very small class. And between that month of July, which has only happened a month ago, um, I only invited 20 people on my list. Four of them uh, killed themselves. And, you know, the most famous Anthony Bourdain, uh, Kate Spade. Um, I don't want to mention everybody's names, but it was just very well-known people that in a way you would think, never think that they may have committed suicide and or had killed themselves. And so it was very tragic. And, uh, and because, especially because I'm doing this in honor of somebody who had killed themselves. And then all of a sudden, Mr. So, Perotti. So just tell us what you are doing. Oh. This, is the, this is the million pound dress, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. So just, just, just take it, what's the concept? Of the, what's gonna happen with the million pound dress? Okay, so the, the, the concept of the million pound dress that had been originally used by Izzy, we had thought originally, I'll just throw diamonds and rubies on the dress and it'd be worth a million, two million, three million. It could be worth 20 million if you wanted it to be. As time has evolved over 10 years, I realized we have to go beyond the, the material and really turn the dress into almost like a fifth dimensional dress. And in the sense that it has to be more a value because of what it represents than what it's worth materially. So what I wanted to incorporate within our million pound dress is all the different charities that are associated with the dress. Each dress will represent the seven continents. So South America, North America, Europe, the Middle East. And we will focus on the culture of each continent and the artists of each country, the music, the theater, and we will travel to each, each place as the couture on the road, you know, because we can create anywhere, no? So, and then at the end, we always have to show up in Paris because we're using fashion and haute couture as the base. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, these shoes, I forget how slippery they are. So the idea is you're going to create eight dresses. Yes. I have to re say that, yeah. yeah so. so the concept is to create eight dresses. These one dress will be turned into eight. Each of the dresses will represent a different continent. Um, and the eighth one being the ocean. The eighth dress is the one that we are going to send to space. Because we want not to think that Izzy died, we want to think Izzy just went to another space. So we're in our own dimension, we're going to send it to space after our three year run. So we're going to do a world tour for three years, eight seasons, each season representing a different a continent. And then the proceeds from these, what, what we, they will go to the foundation? Yes, yeah, so the, all the proceeds will go to the different charities within each continent. So that it's a global effort to help change the world, to make it better, to make it more beautiful, to improve the livelihoods of people on the ground, meaning really the poorest people, the ones who are most fragile, meaning women, you know, single women, women out in, you know, in, in, in situations where there's no work, uh, children, orphans, and the environment. And what we've now incorporated into our charities is the suicide prevention. Why is that? Because I've just ended up out of, I don't know whether it's coincidence, out of destiny or out of fate. Like I said that I'm dedicating the dress to somebody who killed themselves. Our sponsor killed himself. And out of 20 guests, four of you know, the most famous, wonderful people killed themselves within the span of six weeks. So, you know, I reached out to my great friend, Charles Frazier, who works with so many different charities and so many, you know, great things. And I said, what am I going to do? This is, you know, catastrophic. And nobody in the fashion world wants to talk about it. 
And, you know, people were even telling me, don't talk about it. They were saying, no, that's damaging to luxury, to brands, because fashion is all like make-believe in a way, you know, in the sense it's so much based on image. It's so much based on what people think and the perception and society. And so it's, it's such a taboo subject, you know. And I decided, no, let's not make it taboo. Let's, you know, let's talk about it. And, you know, so it was so fantastic when we came here. It was so well received, you know, by the NHS and everybody saying, yes, actually what you're doing is correct. The first step is just to talk about it, just to speak out and not to be scared to talk about it. Because I even see, even within these tr recent tragedies, they don't want to talk about it. Nobody wants to talk about it, you know. And, and so, you know, we just have to try to save one life at a time. You know, it's like we can't save the whole world maybe, but at least one life at a time. So I felt like if I would have had this training of seeing this video before, you know, maybe I, I don't know, it's always a thing of guilt, you know? It's like maybe if I would have seen this video, maybe I could have stopped the suicide, you know? And, or maybe not, you know? But you, you, you know, as long as we're living, we have to keep trying. So when we came to England, you know, one of the first charities we want to support is Zero Suicide Alliance because it's such an important subject to talk about. Why? Because all of a sudden I learned that the number one killer in England for men under 50 is suicide. And this is just insane. We live in, you know, such a prosperous, such a beautiful country, such, you know, there's so many wonderful things. So there's something, there's an epidemic and people, you know, some people don't want to talk about it. And we do want to talk about it. And that's what we want other people to talk about. And just to say there is help there, you know, there, there are people who care. And so we want to reach out to them. And, and from our side as artists, you know, we're calling it zero artists, uh, uh, zero suicide artists. Aliens. Oh, I'm getting confused. What? Zero suicide aliens. Yeah. So from our side, from United Aliens, we want to start a new campaign as well. I mean, we have the Glamour Saves the World, and but part of it is all the different campaigns underneath it, or that we're supporting, and one of them is the Zero Suicide Aliens. Because, well, we don't want more artists to die. Let's just say, just, just to start off that, you know, because I personally think that artists are, you know, more important than politicians or other people like that. Why? Because I don't see a politician that has created a great masterpiece ever, you know, and, you know. So you want to use your, your influence and your contacts, is that right? So at United Aliens, you know, more important than raising funds is really to raise awareness. Because what is raising awareness? No matter how much money you have in the world, that might not save a life, right? We know all that. We're the richest countries in the world. And we haven't managed to save any, you know, we're, we're, we're in this epidemic. So what does that mean? We need to all get together. We need to unite. We need to talk. We need to, uh, need to express ourselves, whether we're depressed, whether we're happy. But it can't be just put under the rug anymore because this is a real life crisis. This is not something that is, it's not a, and I'm scared that it's a trend. You know, from what I'm seeing, you know, I don't want it to be a trend, you know, I don't want it to be like the elite because people look towards fashion world and the art world and all that elite world of, you know, to, as role models. And I don't want to be, you know, I don't want this epidemic from the elite world, what's happening up here, people thinking, oh, yes, it's okay to die, you know, it's okay to take your life, like Alexander McQueen or Isabella Blow or, you know. Anthony Bourdain, all these people, no, they, they had a personal issue. They had their, it was their decision, they did it, we understand. But we don't want that to become a trend, you know? We want, to, we want people to understand, no, it's not a fashionable thing. This is a, it's a serious problem, it's a mental health issue, and we all need to come together on it, and it's, it's no much amount of money in the world. Not even my million pound dress is gonna help. But at least maybe, you know, just like you say, just talking on the street corner to somebody that just looks depressed and just go, hi, how are you? Because what it seems to be that's happening is a lot of them feel isolated, that they're not heard, you know? And that's what leads them to, to you know, to take their life. Because in a way, it's a very violent thing to do. And as what we learned is that, you know, one person committing suicide, it actually affects 20 other people, you know? And so when you start, so if you could imagine that four people on my list, plus my patron, which is number five, just within that month, that's affected 100 people. You know, I mean, just for my patron alone, the city of ballet of Miami is affected. The, the, all the ballet kids in Brazil, all they've all been waiting for their scholarships, you know. I mean, me, it's okay. I know I'll find another sponsor, you know, but it still affects me because I'm like, what's going on? This is an epidemic, you know. So this is why it's, an, it's urgent. 
Well, I think if, if you really want to help support and you really want to help save a life, just talk to me, you know, just talk to anybody. Just, and especially if you, you're in the stronger situation where you've seen that somebody is going through problems or things like this, definitely reach out to them. Don't pretend that nothing, just have another cup of tea. No, this is no longer going to have another cup of tea. This is an epidemic that's going on and people have to talk about it. And so just talk to me, you know.